Well, I'm delighted to say I'm joined by Neve and Connor Duffacy. Neve, you're very welcome. Thank you, Richie. Tell us about this young fella sitting next to you. Uh, Connor is 12 years old now, starting secondary school in September, and he's our oldest child. His sister Holly is 10, um, and yeah, he's a regular 12-year-old. You're a big sports fan. Yes. <laughs> yes, sport is a big deal in your life. Yeah. Yes. Um, I play Gaelic and I play wheelchair basketball, and I like really like soccer. I don't play soccer, but I like it. Connor, seven years ago, had an accident. Yes. Now I'm conscious that I'm asking you to recall memories, which might be a little bit upsetting, so only share what you're comfortable to share. Yeah, OK. Tell so us what happened. So seven years ago, um, I suppose we, we got the phone call. I got the phone call that, that every mammy dreads something is wrong with, with one of your kids. And um, it was a, a big something wrong, I suppose. Um, Connor fell under a ride on lawnmower. Um, his dad was with them, thank God. So initially um, he was airlifted to Cork University Hospital. So um, yeah, we our, our lives just flipped upside down in, in the space of a day. I arrived to Cork and um, the next morning they did the amputation and um, they couldn't save his, his, le his left leg. So I suppose as an amputee there's there's a couple of options. Your best option is below knee, because you still have a knee joint. Worst case scenario is above knee, and we got our, our middle, which was through knee. So um, Connor doesn't have a knee joint, but he has a little bit of, of what's left of the socket there, so it just helps with wearing prosthetics. So I'm using all these words now because I'm used to them, but at the time, you know, uh, uh, our vocabulary changed completely. So, you know, you went from you had to learn words like, as I said, amputee and physio and, you know, all the all the different things. So, um, yeah, we spent two weeks in Cork and um, it was scary. I bet. And yeah. as parents, I suppose, um, the one thing that, that, that I remember, though, is a nurse saying to me, you know, Connor is still the same here and here. And that's so true. And um, we had to explain to Connor, I suppose, that his the way we put it was his body was different and he had what we now call his short leg and we we used that term short leg and it's always stuck so it, connor has a short leg and we said to connor you know um we made him a promise as his parents that we would get him walking again and running again and living his best life and we did and it, it took time and a huge amount of work on on connor's behalf so Cork was the, the initial one where we he had to have a lot of dressing changes and things like that. We went home and we ended up then spending a month in Crumlin in Our Lady's Hospital. Again, dressing changes um, on, on his short leg and that was, that was really tough. Um, Crumlin were great though and we started in Crumlin then doing a lot of, I suppose, our healing. Um, we, we spent time with the psychologist there and we had a social worker and, you know, because as I said, your, your whole life is, is just turned upside down. And then after Crumlin, we went to, well, cr we left Crumlin with a, in a wheelchair and a walking frame, which the walking frame we didn't like, sure we didn't. <laughs> um, you, you, you didn't like the walking frame? No, it was hard to control. It was, the leg is definitely easier than a walking frame in a wheelchair. Yeah, but it took us a while to get to the to the prosthetic leg stage because yeah. there was a lot of swelling and that had to go down. So about, s I think the, the, the accident happened 31st of May and we ended up then by the October we were in Dunleary in the, the National Rehabilitation Hospital and that's where the real hard work started. Where Connor had to be measured and his first prosthetic made and um, a lot of physio. Um, as I said, a lot of hard work. I, I, I don't think... Unless you are familiar with an amputee, you don't realise the amount of work that goes in and, and the amount of effort it takes, you know, to to wear a prosthetic leg. It's it can be tiring and, and that kind of thing. And then you're dealing with skin issues, you know, and things like that. But look, we fought on and he got his first prosthetic and he was only five and a half at the time, so it was a little tiny prosthetic. And there was a huge amount of emotion around that because in one sense, I suppose, we were thrilled that he was up and walking again. It was hard as a mom to see a little metal piece where his old leg had been. So there was, 
you know, there was mixed emotions. Um, Do you remember much about it? Like, you're, you're 12, so this is like more than half your life ago. It's a, it's a long time. Yeah. Well, on the day of the accident, I don't remember much. Um, like, I remember going in the helicopter, like, over to the, uh, over to Cork, and, like, I remember the moments before, and I remember the hospitals really clearly in my rooms, and I, re I remember a good bit, but there's things I don't remember because I was so young, and... I didn't really know what was going on. I know, I know, I remember a good bit and... I think what Connor said there about the fact that you were really young, like, I remember you saying to me at one stage, a couple of days after the accident, you said to me, Mammy, what does brave mean? And I kind of went, why? And you said, because everybody keeps telling me I'm brave and I don't know what it means. And it, it really struck me then that he was dealing with so much at such a young age that we were, using this language and, and talking around him as, you know, as if you should have understood, but he was just a baby really, <laughs> like he was five, you know, um, but he did incredibly well, incredibly well. So you didn't have anyone who was an amputee in your life up until this point. Mm -hmm. So you didn't have anyone to look to as an example of how to get through this. Mm. Or you didn't have anyone to look to as an example of what was possible. Mm. Okay. And when you made the promise there earlier, to Connor, where you said, you know, we're going to get you walking and running. Mm -hmm. Were you always confident that that would be the outcome? Did they tell you that, or was that more of a hopeful statement initially? They told, they told, they told us that he would, he would definitely walk again. How well he walked and how active he would be was up to him, and therefore up to us as parents, because, you know, we had to make, we had to literally, we were googling amputee, we were googling sport disability you know, because we hadn't a clue what we were at. We, 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 we literally, Kieran and I, you know, during the hospital times, like we would nearly have a little parent meeting every night. My, my mum and dad would go in and stay with Connor and we would have like a little regroup that day and we'd say, okay, how did we get on today? How do you feel now? And what do we need to do tomorrow? What questions do we need to ask the doctors? So we almost had to, we structured these meetings, the two of us. And, um, and again, I suppose, People said to us, particularly people like social worker and that in the hospital, you know, be careful because a traumatic incident like that can obviously put a huge strain in a relationship. And I think of anything though, Kieran and I pulled together even more and um, we just knew, yeah, that was our job. So yeah, we were literally Googling things and making it up. But I suppose that's what you do as a parent anyway. There is no <laughs> handbook. Everyone's just waiting. Yeah, it. everybody, you know, and I'm sure we've made mistakes. I'm sure we oh haven't. Yeah. Oh yeah, <laughs> but um, ask you about that in a minute. <laughs> but look, w once Connor was always our focus, and whatever we needed to do, we were prepared to do, and that was it. You know. Tell me about getting involved in sports then with the prosthetic leg. What's that like? Well, after the I got my prosthetic, I started back with the GA, and. I got to play back again, what was it, under sixes, under sevens? Mm. Under uh, sevens, um, I think, by the time, by the time your confidence was yeah. back up enough to be able to, to go back, I suppose. Yeah. That, 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 to me, that sounds quite quickly, that you got your confidence yeah. up quite quickly. That's well, remarkable. It was hard at first with walking on the leg, and I think I just, as I got, as I got used to walking, I could start then running and swimming and everything. Um, and then after Gael, Gael, I got back to Gaelic, I went to amputee football, which is football on crutches, where the off-field players have one leg and the pe the people in the goal only have one arm. So I, I did that for a good couple of years. I don't do it anymore, but um, yeah, that was a good thing. And I was such around everyone that was like me, that had, you know, a disability or was the same as me, where is in Gaelic, you know, I was the only person there with one leg. So amateur football was really good because I can, you know, relate, everyone can relate to me and I can relate to them and I can talk to people about what's like having like with one leg where I couldn't do that with other people in Gaelic or soccer or whatever. And then wheelchair basketball. Oh, sorry, yeah, wheelchair basketball. My dad's the coach and um, we're in Athlone as Shannonside Steelers, my wheelchair basketball club and 
there's my friends play with me. Um, they just hop in a chair as well, yeah, like, even though they don't have disabilities. Anybody really? can play wheelchair basketball, yeah. There's a couple of us with disabilities on the team, but like you can bring along your friends and you know hop in a chair and like it's not that hard, you know. It's a good bit of crack, and you know we do blitzes and stuff, but we haven't got to do anything in like in a year and a half now because of COVID and everything because it's all indoors. But hopefully we get back to it soon because I got I got a new chair wheelchair like three weeks before lockdown and I couldn't use it at all because we weren't playing so it's stuck in the garage now for about a year so hopefully I can get back to it soon. Is it okay for people to ask you about the leg when they meet you or is that inappropriate? Well like a little child like if under the age of like eight or whatever um, like I, I don't think it's rude because you know I'd, I, I'd be the same I'd be curious I'd be asking um, I wouldn't say it's rude. It's it can be quite quite annoying sometimes. But like adults or teenagers or whatever, that can be quite. I would I wouldn't say rude, but you'd kind of know better yeah. than to ask, ask. Ask. Yeah. We we we've said to Connor that people can can glance, do a kind of a say, oh look at that if he walks by him, and we get that. Yeah. But if if people um, point. Pointing annoys us. <laughs> Pointing. Pointing yeah. That's not cool. Yeah, yeah. it's not cool at all. Um, I suppose when people ask then what happened, we have told one or two funny stories. Well, yeah, th we have some funny really? things. Really? Well, yeah, like a shark, like I'd say like I was in Australia and a crocodile bit it off or yeah. you like... And um, Holly told people for a long time that you fell off a trampoline and your leg fell off. Yeah. But, um, Do people believe the shark story? <laughs> Usually not. Well, I don't know. <laughs> like I say that and they're like, oh, okay, <laughs> never mind. But like... Yeah, I suppose we, 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 that was something we had to to kind of teach you, I don't know if you remember, like, but when you were soon after the accident, if we were in playgrounds and stuff, kids would, because you were, you know, he was still small and kids would, and we had to kind of give Connor the um, the language if kids did ask him, because he used to say to us, I don't want to talk about it. So we used, just used to say to you, just say, I had an accident and I don't like to talk about it. And usually that was enough. Um, uh, we have had silly idiots that go, really, what kind of an accident? But, which is intrusive. Um, but usually people, we just say, look, he, he had an accident. Listening to you talk about not only the, the, the accident, but the, the recovery, and we spoke before, we, we started this chat. Sport and the GAA really has played a big part in things. Definitely, yeah. Well, I play Gaelic now with... Um, the under thirteens and most, um, and like, I guess it keeps you occupi occupied as well. Like, if I didn't have sport, you know, you'd be sitting down all day on. on Don't turn your Xbox because you wouldn't be allowed. On no, I'm Xbox. like on the couch watching TV, like you know, or it it keeps you occupied and it keeps you fit, and especially, you know, like I'm able to I'm able to play as part of a team, and you know you lose some and you win some, but it's still good to be able to lose as part of a team. And also to win, it's very nice to win. But yeah, I think t the team element is a big one because, you know, like after the accident, I I didn't do anything. Like I didn't have any sports. It constantly be like physio with people and going to places like the play therapy and all that. Um, well, I guess when I got back to sports and I could just be with my friends and have a bit of crack and kick a ball. Like so, that the sport definitely played a big part. So would you have any message for anyone watching this who is adjusting to life with a disability? What would you say to them? Try and find the positive in everything. Like it can be hard sometimes, like when everything's going wrong, but you try and find just one thing that's positive and think about that and try and get do something to get take your mind off everything because I know like for sport for me or swimming or just sitting down with your friends and having a chat like it it just takes everything else away and you can just think about the positives so I think definitely trying to think about the positive things in life is definitely something that will get you through that. That's helped you? Definitely yeah when well I've had my family to keep me laughing and keep me smiling so that was yeah, if you, when you when you have a family as good as mine, it definitely makes it easier. They've been great, haven't they? Definitely, yeah. Especially my little sister Holly, she's always helping me with things. Like if I can't get something, she's up and getting it for me. Like and 
she's a really big help, definitely. She did tell me before we spoke that you sometimes attack each other too. <laughs> attack each other? <laughs> this is the words, actual words she used. <laughs> we attack each other. <laughs> I don't know about that attacking. <laughs> sometimes she gets annoyed at me and she takes it out on physically, but <laughs> I don't know about tackling each other. <laughs> Mum, yeah. final word to you. Oh gosh. <laughs> what message would you have to families who are going through what you've been through? Um, you're not alone. Um, reach out. There are supports out there. Um, talk to people and um, find out what your child can get involved in. And um, life is, is different, but um, you will smile again and you will get through it. Um, and you may even come out of it a stronger person and a better person and a stronger family, I think we have. Um, and we've learned not to sweat the small things anymore because we've been through the biggest thing that we could possibly be through. And so yeah, the small things we don't sweat anymore and just, I suppose, we love each other and we we roll with the punches, don't we, Connor? Yeah. Good days and bad. <laughs> Thanks a million for coming here today and telling us your story. Thanks. For and having best me. of luck in secondary school. Thank you. <laughs> Maeve, thank Connor, you so much. Thanks a million. Thanks.